No, no, it's fine. Good afternoon. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Miami University Alumni Association's webinar series, the Miami Alumni Travel Program presents Exploring Costa Rica through Science, Culture, and Photography. Joining us for today's conversation are frequent travelers to the region, Dr. Hayes Cummins, Dr. Donna McCollum, and photographer Ron Stevens, who will also serve as trip leaders on the upcoming 2024 Miami Explorers alumni trip to Costa Rica. A little bit about our guests. Hayes Cummins is Professor Emeritus, former Distinguished Educator and Harrison Scholars Professor in the Western Program and Geography at Miami University. Uh, Donna McCollum is an ecologist with an expertise in stream and riparian ecosystem, native plants, restoration, and tropical and marine ecology, as well as environmental science. Ron Stevens is an award-winning photographer who has taught photography in the Department of Art at Miami University for over 30 years. He's conducted numerous travel photography workshops and seminars throughout the United States and internationally. Currently, Ron is the director of Miami University's Art Center and Craft Summit programs. Welcome to the three of you, and thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with us about your all of your eco travel adventures in Costa Rica and perhaps maybe a little nugget or two of information about the upcoming trip in 2024. I know it's going to be super exciting. So welcome to all of you. So glad to have you. Hi. Great to be here. Excellent. So Ron, I know you've got a little presentation to pull up. Hayes, I'll let you take it from here and I'll, I'll go hang out in the back. Thanks for being okay. here. Thank you, Molly. You're Hello, welcome. everybody. It's uh, great to, to be here today. We're going to share a little bit about our adventures in Costa Rica. And uh, so we'll, we'll start right now. Uh, next slide. So Costa Rica is located in Central America, uh, just uh, south of Nicaragua and north of Panama. Uh, it's a very wonderful place to go. I've, I've been to Costa Rica for over three decades and I, I keep going back because I love it so much. Ne next slide. Next slide. <laughs> next slide. Okay. So what I want to do first is just kind of provide a, a brief background of uh, Costa Rica itself. Uh, what helps it make such, it be such a unique environment, a unique country, uh, and why we like to go there and teach. Uh, right now, the population is about 5 million people. About 1% are indigenous. And on our uh, trips, we, we spend time, time with indigenous peoples. It's a democracy. Uh, it has uh, typically a, a, between 60 and 70% of people vote, which is, and at times is much higher than the number of people in the United States that, that vote. It has a, a high literacy rate, universal medical coverage, no standing army, 30 national parks, about 25% of the country is protected. And in terms of energy usage, it, it has gone as long as 299 days just using renewable energy. Next slide. So from an ecological perspective, I'm a scientist and I, I like, uh, this is how I approached Costa Rica, initially anyway. It's got one of the highest biodiversity for, for such a small land area in the world. Four to five percent of the world's biodiversity is in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is about the size of West Virginia, so that's pretty incredible. It's got a tropical climate. It's about 80 degrees north of, of the equator. Uh, it, it's interesting. Geography is all due to plate tectonics, uh, and it's very active from a geologic perspective. And it, in the, it served as a it serves as a biological corridor between North and South America. Costa Rica is relatively young. It, uh, it was uplifted completely about four to five million years ago. And at that point, it served as an interstate highway between North and South America. Next slide. So what I'm gonna do uh, is, is give a, a brief overview of some of the geology of Costa Rica and what helps shape the landscape. That you can't disconnect the biodiversity from the underlying foundation of, the, of plate tectonics. Next slide. So this is a, a, a map of uh, showing plate boundaries. And Costa Rica is 
uh, very active geologically. It has upwards of, of around four, over 4,000 earthquakes a year. I personally experienced two, two earthquakes that I could feel. Uh, there's subduction going on, there's uplift going on, there's volcanic activity. Uh, it makes, it takes a, a, a country, a picture it being flat, and then you put plate tectonics in the game and, and it, you have uplift, you have mountains that reach as high as 12 to 13,000 feet tall. Next slide. All right, next. Kind of go through these. These are just pointing out, keep going, next slide. The various mountain ranges in Costa Rica. Next slide. And as small as Costa Rica is, it's got, next slide there. Okay, perfect. Um, as small as Costa Rica is, it's got four distinct mountain ranges. The Talamancas are from the Central Valley south, and the Talamancas are not volcanic. It's all from uplift of former sea floor. The Central Valley is where San Jose is, and it's got uh, volcanoes that rim on the eastern side of, of San Jose. The Tilaran is another mountain range, which includes uh, Arenal. And then Guanacaste is up in the extreme northwest part of the country. So uh, lots of geology going on, and it's played a huge role in, in the formation or promoting biodiversity in Costa Rica. Next slide. So I, I point this out. Uh, in 1991, uh, there was a 7.7 magnitude earthquake on the Caribbean coast that was very near the surface. And what happened with this earthquake, it caused extensive uh, uplift along the Caribbean coast. And what you're seeing in the background there, that used to be a coral reef that was underwater. And when that earthquake happened, it was uplifted over a meter out of the water uh, in a geologic instant. Next slide. Uh, this just shows the Costa Rica volcanoes and uh, Talamanca region. Next slide there, Ron. I've got a couple of arrows, so keep going through there. Okay, stop. Uh, the blue line represents the Talamanca Mountains. Um, non-volcanic, there's sedimentary rock and igneous rock and so on, but they were, it's been uplifted from the seafloor. The Central Valley, the Tilleran and the Guanacaste is where the, uh, uh, our currently active volcanoes are. And we're gonna uh, spend some time talking a little bit about Arenal. Next slide. Okay, climate. Uh, because we're near the tropics, they have the weather systems in uh, Costa Rica are dominated by what's called the intertropical convergence zone. And the sun during the course of a year moves north and south of the equator, and it's directly overhead of Costa Rica tw two times a year. It has an immense um, impact on what happens weather-wise in Costa Rica. Combine that with plate tectonics, uh, mountains, and, and surrounding oceans, and you get some very interesting weather phenomena. Next, next slide. So ne next slide. Yeah. All right, so the arrow, whoops, back up a little. The arrows are pointing toward Costa Rica and they're, they're supposed to, for, from my perspective, represent the trade winds. Now, if the Costa Rica were a flat country, the trade winds would take all that moisture and move it from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side. However, because we know Costa Rica is so mountainous, you have all these moisture laden winds blowing year round um, it, and run into the mountains of Costa Rica and has a huge impact on the amount of rainfall that falls on the country. Next slide. Now this map, this is a map of rainfall amounts and those units are in meters. Uh, put it into perspective, uh, Southwest Ohio has about a meter, a little over a meter of water a year. If you look on the Caribbean, on the, on the Caribbean side of these mountain ranges, you have six to seven meters of water, of rain. That's over 20 feet, 22 feet of water falling every year. Uh, of course, uh, as you go northward, it gets drier. Um, where the rainfalls drops to about a meter and a half a year. But even, even with that, it's still an incredible amount of water that falls on this tropical country. Next slide. Uh, now, the mountains, this is a beautiful photograph. Um, we're on the leeward side of Monte Verde, and you have all this moisture coming in from the Caribbean, and it, it hits the mountains where Monte Verde is, and it goes up, up, and then it, it goes back down. And as it goes back down, the air dries out. And that's a beautiful example of a rain shadow. Next slide. 
This is what the Pacific Slope looks like in that part of Costa Rica. On the Caribbean side, it, it's pretty green, moist, more water. On the Pacific side, at certain times of the year, this is what it looks like. It dries out dramatically, primarily because it's on the leeward side of the mountains. Next slide. All right, this is a, a complicated map of what's called the Holdred's Lifestones. And what ecologists have done is try to make sense out of all the biodiversity around the world. And they look at such things as, as temperature, altitude, and moisture. And then you can, it makes a triangle. And from that triangle, uh, you can kind of uh, intersect lines and see what kind of, uh, of, of environment it might, it might uh, offer to the organisms that live there. And as you can see, with all those different colors, Costa Rica is loaded with different life zones, different temperatures in the higher elevations, different amount of precipitation at the high levels and the low levels, different temperatures, so on and so forth. So what this has done, the plate tectonics through the mountain uplift and so on is to promote biodiversity by impacting climate on a micro level. Next slide. Uh, just to keep in mind, the past has been very dynamic. I'm not going to spend any time on it other than to say that there have been glaciers in the, in the recent geologic past uh, 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 several times. Next slide. All right, this is the great faunal exchange when Costa, Le Costa Rica was uplifted uh, and that interstate highway between North and South America was, was present. We had all sorts of mammals from isolated South America that were able to go to North America and animals going from North America to South America. It had a huge biological Im impact on both, both continents. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over now. We're gonna go to one of our favorite places, the Caribbean coast, uh, and Ron Stevens is gonna share a little bit about that. Greetings all. Uh, the Caribbean coast is, I, I'd like, if I had to pick one favorite part of Costa Rica, I would say Costa Rica, but the Caribbean coast is just a pretty amazing aspect of that. And being a photographer, uh, it's one of those areas where every time you turn around, uh, there's something you could drop your camera or your cell phone and get an amazing photograph there. So in the southeastern Caribbean coast area, it's the home to, now there's many areas here, but I'm going to focus, excuse the photo pun, on just a few of the areas, uh, Chuita, um, the Chuita National Park, the Manzalino National Wildlife Ra Refuge, the Ara Manzalino Project, which is the Great Green Macaw Rescue and Reintroduction Area, and the Yorkin Ind Indigenous Village, which is the home to the Bree Bree. So I'm going to start with the Bree Bree and do this briefly. Uh, the, the Bree Bree area or the Yorkin Village uh, was actually um, established about 30 years ago, though the people lived in the area longer, but it was actually formed into like a, a, a village per se. But they only actually started accepting visitors into this area about 20 years ago on a regular basis. Um, to get to the Yorkin village, you travel upriver in a dugout canoe, one of the coolest things I've ever done. Um, and after about a 45 minute or so, depending on the river flow uh, trip, you end up in this wonderful, uh, very, it's not overly remote, but very pristine. And um, in some ways you would almost think of it at a comparison to say the Amish in, in our country. Uh, the, the area is home to about 10,000 of the Bri Bri uh, people. Uh, mostly, they have their own language, actually, and to a great extent, they do speak their own language, and many of them also speak English. Uh, within this area, they practice, uh, they live in a way, or their normal, cult, their uh, historical culture, and practice their uh, historical religious practices. They survive growing a variety of crops and then supplement that with also ecotourism. And there are some that do travel out and would have regular jobs uh, within the community. And one, of, one of the really interesting and fun things about going there, this was their kind of meeting house and uh, dining area when you come into the village, is that they um, will show you, how, they'll make a lunch for you or dinner 
um, show you a variety of their customs and making chocolate, which was quite dear to my heart. Um, that you talk about chocolate, I can smell it as I say this. It is just the most wonderful, amazing experience to see this. Now, it's a matriarchal society, so the women actually establish most of the procedures and things of what they're doing. Um, and they had us making, crunching up this chocolate. That is, uh, I, I want a glass of milk right now as I'm looking at this. Um, then they, they will make lunch for us. Uh, and wonderful, very friendly people. They have a variety of, uh, in addition. So this is a way that they are also, besides just showing you what's going on, they're also making money this way. They have a variety of things that they make that you can buy while you're there in addition to the chocolate. Uh, I almost left my camera so that I could bring more chocolate home for, with it. Uh, they showed us one of their traditional things is actually hunt with bow and arrow. So we had a guide that was showing us how they were hunting with their bow and arrow. Um, and one, one of our group, uh, when we went two years ago, uh, she was actually successful at hitting something. There's, uh, again, just a one, wonderful place in which they're living. Uh, they do have what, what might be a surprise, as Hayes was mentioning earlier, it's an incredibly high literacy rate for the entire country. And that also extends into the Bree Bree uh, uh, community. They, it's mandatory that they go to school through the sixth grade, and then they have the additional schooling uh, two years and three years that, that are often uh, chosen. And a very interesting thing about the Bribri people that we encountered them throughout our trip as they had become often uh, would go on to trade school and become eco tour guides, which was a very interesting thing. The, the children, the, the beautiful, just wonderful children, this little guy's not overly happy, but I think he managed to talk his mom into what he was looking for. So then after we come back out of, uh, uh, of this area, the next area that we we'll talk, talk a little bit about is the Chuita National Forest. It is actually a lowland tropical forest and it was established in 1970. It has 2,600 acres that are set aside for it, as uh, Hayes had mentioned also, that an enormous amount of Costa Rica is protected lands. And now within the borders of this national park, uh, there is coral reefs, uh, which as the one photograph that Hayes was showing earlier, uh, the reef partially was destroyed in the 1991 earthquake when it was that large section of it was lifted up by 10 feet. Um, there's mangrove forest within the coconuts, um, a variety of other types of, of uh, different growth and animals. Um, it also has a beach mangrove forest, lots of marine life. It's home to, um, <laughs> this is actually one of the most photographed creatures in Costa Rica. It's a red-eyed tree frog and they're everywhere and they're just beautiful to see. Um, there's also ibis um, that grow there, toucans, sloths, various types of monkeys, frogs, numerous bird species. This is in that area again where it was the reef was uplifted. Um, howler monkey and um, sloths. And, and of course, uh, on that highway of traveling back and forth, the uh, raccoons that, that come along. Uh, another area is the Manzalino National Wildlife Refuge, which actually protects the area within that. It protects about 70% of the southern care. Caribbean coastal area goes from Manzalino to actually to the Panama border. Uh, within that, there are 350 species of different birds. It has the only natural mangrove oyster bed. Um, there's manatees, crocodiles, talpins, dolphins, and also uh, a variety of <laughs> our lizard friends. Getting into the, um, sorry, my slides are going slower than I thought. An area that to me that was just incredibly fascinating was the Aria Manzalino uh, Preserve or the Great Green Macaw Preserve. And this area is actually a rescue and reintroduction site for the Great Green Macaws. 
Uh, the area was established about 35 years ago and has grown and changed and morphed in many ways due to that. In 2015, the great green macaw was listed as an endangered species as a result of logging, uh, agriculture, cattle pasturing, and even mining. So they were continually losing the area in which that they were um, uh, living. So this was, um, they started a reintroduction program in 2010. So they, they would take chicks um, and, or eggs and get the chicks to come. And it was the first of its kind to where they would save these birds and provide a habitat where they could grow. And as, two th as of 2022, there are 20 uh, artificial nests that they've created, and they were able to reintroduce, uh, 50 of the chicks from that time survived, and they were able to reintroduce those grown birds in to that region, and they joined the free-flying population within that region. Unfortunately, the green macaw is still on the endangered species, critically endangered species uh, list, actually, but they have been able to uh, slow that to some extent as a result of um, the reintroduction process that they've done. Donna? You, okay, I'm going to take you to uh, a couple of the places that I really like and as we move into the highlands. Okay, next. Um, this is a classic um, conic shape of a volcano. It's a, a pyroclastic uh, volcano. Okay, keep going. And it was actually, after being dormant for centuries, in 1968, it erupted, uh, killed 70 some people, and flowed down into the nearby villages of La Fortuna uh, that was near the base. And when we have been teaching in Costa Rica for many, many years, we were lucky enough to get views like this because we would go out at night and watch these giant boulders being spewed out of the top of the volcano, um, bounce down the hillside so that if anybody had not believed in dragons, I would have been totally surprised because it was the perfect setting as you get fire shooting up out of the top of the volcano, bouncing and then spreading, and then each one of those pieces of boulders bouncing and spreading again. So it looked exactly like a, a dragon rising out of the top of the mountain and coming down. Okay, you can go on though, because unfortunately we don't uh, have that anymore. But this is the path we will take. If you look at the far right, you see we were down in southeastern uh, Caribbean coast. We would move on up to the port city of Limon and then head cross to the northwest up through a largely agricultural pasture, uh, many crops area as we work our way up into the highlands. Remember Hayes said, okay, you can go on. He said that the these slopes are up at about 12 to 13,000 feet, about 4,000 meters. Um, Limon is a multicultural city. Quite an interesting one. It's a hub of all kinds of imports and exports. Um, huge, I don't know if you can see the huge crates, the, the, the uh, carriers that go stacked 10 high on a big cargo ship that goes across the Atlantic over who knows where in the world. Okay, you can go on. Um, this is what most of the landscape looks like that we'll be traveling through after we get away from the coast. Lots of pasture, lots of homes sprinkled here and there. And next, um, we'll see lots of fruit stands along the way. Costa Rica grows an, abundant, an abundance of different kinds of fruit. You can see mangoes here at the right, right front corner, my very favorite. We've got lots of different kinds of squash, pineapple, uh, guanabana, all kinds of things. Keep going. Uh, and this is my very favorite. It's here because it's my favorite type of ice cream. This is soursop. Um, it's kind of that sweet, sour tang that you get. The very best of ice cream flavors. Next. Along the way, you'll see a lot of homes that look like this. Because we're in the lower altitudes of the mountains, working our way up, 
uh, people have extravagant tropical flowers that are available for growth in their yards. So you see a lot of homes and resorts that look a lot like this with beautiful plantings. Next. And then finally, we're at the Arenal area. And there is that classic volcano that wherever you are in the area, you can't miss seeing it unless it's cloudy and then you don't see it. Next. One of the favorite things to do while we were in the Arenal area is to go to Arenal Volcano National Park. And you can see on this map here, starting in the middle, there are paths that take you over to the south eastern slope of the volcano. And it's there that we'll actually hopefully step up onto new land. Um, in 1992, there was a flow that broke through the side of the crater and a huge amount of volcanic material rolled down the slope, wiping out everything in its path. And uh, yeah, so it's brand new earth. Okay, keep going. This is on the way, we'll go through uh, a lot of old farmland. Because volcanic ash, and this is what most often has been spewed by these volcanoes, ash is very, very rich in minerals. And so the land around the volcanoes often is very, very good farmland. So we'll be hiking through old farmland, often with a chance to see things like this non-venomous snake. And this is uh, one of the sweetest and be most beautiful birds in Costa Rica. This is a, a female or juvenile honey creeper, probably a green honey creeper. Hard to tell. Next. Um, there's, there are several different kinds of parakeets. And on the bottom, you see a rufous-tailed hummingbird. This is an um, almost an omnipresent hummingbird in Costa Rica. However, Unlike here in Ohio, where we have just one species of hummingbird, um, Costa Rica has, well, three pages in the field guide of hummingbirds. And of course, everybody loves moths and butterflies that we see in abundance as well. Okay, next. All right, and here's the brand new land. I climb up to the top of that 1992 flow and the next, and usually, keep going, and a lot of students uh, like to hang around at the top because you get this nice close-up view of the mountain. And again, you see the top or not based on the, the clouds. Next. But just lounging around where you see Arenal Lake, which provides uh, about 90%, I think, of the country's um, hydroelectric power. Um, and after that nice climb up, it's great just to sit at the top of the mountain, reveling in the, the awesome fact that you are sitting on brand new earth and looking out at tropical forest. Keep going, that's fine. Um, there's still lots to see, even though it's only 30 years old, these three pictures of flowers are all orchids that came within the first 15 years that the, that the lava had flowed. We've got two different kinds of uh, reptiles, there, I think the one on the left is an anole and the one on the top might be an anole, I can't remember. Next. As we come down off of that new land, we get into some old growth forest. When the, when the lava flowed down the mountainside, it, it didn't flow in a nice big straight line, it skipped patches. And so there are patches of old growth forest in there. And you can see the size of the tree that she is climbing a vine up in between these two giant buttresses of this tree. Just magnificent. It would take our whole class time to go around. But keep going. That's great. Keep to the next one. The cloud forest of Monteverde is my very, very favorite place in Costa Rica. Go to the next slide. Monteverde cloud forest and the next slide. Um, it's a keep, yeah, it's a biological oasis that was saved. You can sit one more. It was saved because um, about half a century ago, a Quaker community that used the mountains as their watershed for clean water realized that so much of the country was being developed, they wanted to save their clean water. And so they preserved um, thousands, tens of thousands of acres at the top of this mountain. Um, hit one more next. What caught, and one more. What causes a cloud forest is that the tops of these mountains are bathed in the clouds. Most of the moisture that these forests get 
comes from the clouds, not from rain per se, dropping down. Okay, keep going. You can see then, because it's the mountains jutting up high enough that they are bathed in clouds, you can see that um, cloud forests are, are very rare. They are at the tip tops of the mountains. And so you have a, a, a cloud forest here, and then you have a valley, and then you have a cloud forest at the next mountain. Because of that, they are, number one, very rare. They only represent about 1% of the world's uh, forests. Number two, they are very high in endemic species, species that only exist in this cloud forest and nowhere else on earth. Because remember, if you're a tiny little creature that likes this nice moist climate, to get to another cloud forest, you have to go down the valley and back up to another one. And so that leads to evolution of species that are distinct for that area and only there anywhere in the world. So it's one of my favorite things about cloud forests. But keep going. Cloud forests are noted for their forests. Now you can run through these at about every, you know, four or five seconds. I'll try to raise my finger or something, Ron. Um, a cloud forest in Monteverde is very, very thick. It still has giant trees and lots of lianas. Lianas are named for woody vines that are common in most of the tropics. This is, by the way, one of our guides uh, who will be with us next tree. Oh, and the next tree that you just saw is one that is actually a strangler fig. All of those little pieces hanging down are roots that used to be around a host tree, a mother tree, and the mother tree has long since died out, and now the strangler fig tree has its own support up in there. How cool is that? Um, there is a bridge or two in the clouds uh, that will put you right up in the top of this canopy and keep going because this is my favorite. Oops, that's, yeah, that's just one of my favorite photos. Everybody has those moments where they're just in awe of what they're seeing, but keep going. All right, this is my favorite part. If you look at a tree in the rain, in the cloud forest, you often may be looking at half other stuff. Epiphytes and hemihepiphytes are all over the place. These plants are adapted for absorbing water from the clouds. They don't have to wait on the rain. So you've got mosses like on the left and on the right. You've got uh, bromeliads that you see on the right. Keep going and you can slip through these pretty quickly. You can see that this leaning tree has, well, you can hardly see the trunk of it. It's so covered with epiphytes. More? Next, ah, and you can see the moss hanging from the trees there. It's just a, a lovely place. Next, next, you can flip through all these. There. Oh, but this is my favorite. Actually, back up one, because this was a log, a branch that had fallen down. You can see, you can no longer even see that it's a branch. It is so covered with epiphytes. Okay, next, that coverage of uh, massive vegetation extends even to the forest floor. So this is a, a little log. I don't know if you can quite make out, but that's a hollow log and it's been completely covered by ferns and other bromeliad, I mean, sorry, other uh, green plants, mosses, that moist atmosphere provides sustenance for everything. Next. Bromeliads are everywhere. Um, they're in the trees. They're on this branch that fell down. They're even on the grounds. Bromeliads are relatives of our pineapples. And um, Spanish moss is another bromeliad. There are all kinds of different ones. The abundance of species and abundance of the plants themselves is just remarkable in a cloud forest. Next. And who likes mushrooms? Um, if you like mushrooms, I always find myself stopping along trails around here anytime I find a mushroom. Um, but the cloud forest is a wonderful place for mushrooms. The cool and moist climate um, means that that rapid decomposition is happening everywhere. Next. This is a special thing though. This is, this is something that perplexed scientists for years. This is a slime mold. At certain times of its life, a slime mold is like an animal. It's a small flagellated cell that can move. Um, and other times it looks more like this, like a fungus. Very neat creature. Next. And of course, one of the 
striking characteristics of the cloud forest is tree ferns. This is a fern, but it's about 40 feet tall. Next, hard to imagine. Butterflies in abundance. I love the clearwing butterflies. Next. Um, and Costa Rica, someone asked in a question earlier, if Costa Rica is a good place for birding, and the answer is a vociferous yes. There's all kinds of great birds there. These are just a few that we've that we've found along the way. Next. Once in a while, you catch something special like this. Tro I think it's a trogon that is uh, that has caught its meal. And next, and every once in a while, you get something really spectacular like a three waddled bellbird. The three waddled bellbird has a great mating ritual. The male sits on the end of the tree and he goes, me, 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 bonk. And that's his bonk. So I think Hayes managed to catch that picture. What a great picture. Next, as I said before, hummingbirds are abundant and this is the largest and maybe one of the most spectacular, the violet saber wing. Next. This is the people looking for a really special bird uh, that everyone goes to Monteverde for, and that's the resplendent quetzal. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see why. What a magnificent bird with a lot of history all the way back to the ancient peoples that lived in this country. Next. Ah, you might have to look closely for this one. What looks like just a stick hanging in the middle of the air on the left. If you look closely in the middle of that one on the right, you will see a spider, which relies on its camouflage as a stick to be able to attract prey. Next. And speaking of camouflage, do you see the insect here? If you haven't found it yet, look about uh, toward almost toward the middle and you might see three little legs that look kind of like sticks around where the fingers are. This is a giant walking stick. Great. Great, great thing. Next, night hikes. This is the last part I'll get off of here. Night hikes are just fabulous at Monteverde because one of the things you often look for on night hikes is the little things, the insects. So keep going. You can run through these pretty quickly. Everybody gets excited. It's part anticipation, part fear. Lots of different kinds of crickets, lots of different kinds of walking sticks and mantis. Oh, you stop on this one though, because look closely. That uh, that granddaddy long leg is not really huge, but look what he's actually eating. He's actually eating his meal. And if you look closely in the middle of that leaf on the left, do you see the spider? What great camouflage. Next. And frogs are often in abundance there. I just love this little tree frog. Next. Um, moths are outstanding. So many moths at Monteverde and they all look like what's under your feet. Dead leaves, uh, compost on the ground, all those different colors of brown, they're remarkable. Next, lots of creepy crawlies, a scarab beetle, um, millipedes that are out busy at night scavenging um, decomposing matter. Next, and everybody loves bat. This is the beauty. There's a, a hummingbird feeder there that attracts bats as well. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the bat guy. You can see he is holding a bat. Bats, bats that are mostly small. They're not huge like that picture you just saw. And this man has devoted his life to studying bats. He actually has uh, established a bat jungle in the town of Monteverde that's like a, a museum for bats. It's fantastic. Next. The Continental Divide is usually our last stop. Here, keep going, and this will be our, my last slide. Um, you'll see people looking out over into the Caribbean, and if they turned around just backwards there, they would look over onto the Pacific side. So here, any, land, any water that falls on the left rolls to the Caribbean, on the right flows to the Pacific. What happens is because those trade winds are whipping across the top of there, the trees that you see in here, which are only about as tall as the people, are actually hundreds of years old but they're so beat up by that constant wind that they just don't grow very fast. Okay, Hayes, you take it to the next group. Thank you, Don. All right, so we're gonna uh, wrap up today's conversation uh, with the, going to the Corcovado National Park region. 
shown by the arrow. Next slide. And uh, it's located, the park is located on the Osa Peninsula. It's in the, the south Costa Rica on the Pacific coast. It's one of the most remote parks in Costa Rica. Um, and it has the very high biodiversity. It gets three to five meters of rainfall a year. Uh, it's an incredible place to visit. It's one of my favorite places to go. I'm an oceanographer by training. Um, you get the combination of the oceans, the mountains, and the incredible biodiversity. Uh, so I can't, can't wait to get back. Next slide. So here's a cartoon picture of, of the Osa Peninsula. And the red arrows point out different places where we, we have gone in the past and where we hope to go on our alumni trip in 2024. Uh, we'll stay at a place called Drake Bay Wilderness Camp, the, the upper arrow on the right. And the island, it's a, off to the left, is called Cano Island. And it's about 20 kilometers offshore. And we do uh, some snorkeling there, on, and you'll see corals and sharks and turtles and so on. And then the two arrows on the bottom represent where Corcovado National Park is located. Uh, this is a fantastic park with incredible biodiversity. It will go to two different entrances. One is called San Pedrillo. The other is called Sirena, the arrow on the bottom. Next slide, please. Uh, the coastal areas are loaded with mangroves. In fact, one of the larger mangrove reserves in the world is just north of the Oso Peninsula, where they have upwards of 10,000 hectares of mangroves that are protected. Next. Mangroves, I don't know how many of y'all have been to mangroves, but they are very, very important for, uh, they serve as nursery grounds for many invertebrates and as well as uh, young juvenile fish. So we need mangroves. They're a very important part of, of, of tropical ecosystems. Uh, while they're not as diverse as the uh, rainforests that are only a couple hundred meters away in some instances, they have a tremendous amount of living biomass. Next. There's so much to see. You can see these, these two students. Uh, they were graduate students in, in IES at Miami. Uh, you can see how enthralled they are as they're looking for critters that are living on, these, on the barks of these mangroves. Next. Uh, this is just a picture of Ron and Donna and myself and one of our guides, Manuel, on the right. Um, all our guides are terrific. I have nothing but good things to say about her. This is just one of our guides, and we, he's been with us for uh, over a decade, the decade, maybe even two, where if he's available, he comes with us and helps us explore these regions. Next. Uh, here's at um, Carcavado National Park. Remember I said the Talamanca mountain range was geologically uplifted. There are no volcanoes. In that, in, that, in that mountain range, but the former sea floor is uplifted. And what we're looking at here is old lava from near a spreading center uh, that was uplifted to form that, this shoreline. Uh, the Osa Peninsula, because it was it's the geology, the past geology was near a spreading center, there's lots of gold deposits and so on. So there's always a conflict between the people who wanna go uh, prospect for gold and the, and the preservation in the park. Next. Uh, this is a view from where we're, we're going to be staying. This is where we stayed in the past, and we hope to stay in January of 2024. It's Drake Bay Wilderness Camp, and it's just north of, of, of uh, Carcavado National Park. Next. Now, um, at this leg of, of the trip, we do a lot of traveling on boats. Uh, we have very competent, well-trained boat captains, and that they'll get us to the Canyon Island offshore and get us to the park entrances in Corcovado. Next, next slide. Next slide. You get terrific views of the coastline. And this is one of the reasons I'm so enamored with this part of Costa Rica is the, the mountains come right to the sea. Uh, they're beautiful, they're rugged. It's just gorgeous. Next. Next. And you can see this is just a picture, a typical picture of, of people on the boats. And if you can look at their faces, I think we're just coming back from a, a day at Carcavado and everybody's just juiced up from the experience. Next. 
Uh, this is on our way to a uh, boat ride to the furthest in park entrance is a, a little over an hour. And so uh, it's a beautiful ride. Sometimes we see humpback whales. We, uh, on one of the recent trips, we saw a mother humpback with a baby calf and the baby calf was coming toward the boat. We stopped to look at her and the mother got between the calf and the boat. It was really cool to see. Next. Next. Uh, typically we do beach landings. Uh, this is at San Badrillo Field Station um, in, in Corcovado National Park. Next. Uh, we see lots of, lots of wildlife. Uh, this is a bare-throated tiger heron. Next. Scarlet macaw. For the first 15 or 20 years that uh, we've been going to uh, Corcovado, the scarlet macaws were, the, the population numbers were very low, but they've started a conservation program with building nest, nest boxes, uh, keep stopping people from killing them. And now you can't go to Corcovado without seeing a ton of scarlet macaws. I still get so excited about it, but people, the students, they, they see so many of them, like, oh, that's scarlet macaw. And they, they go, ah, another scarlet macaw. But I, I still, I can't get over how beautiful they are. And, and it's a real conservation success story. Next. Uh, th these are uh, two pictures of king vultures. Uh, these are very large vultures that from Mexico all the way down through South America. It's always a thrill to look for them and a thrill to find them and a thrill to just be awed by them. Next. Of course, here's some frogs. We see lots of frogs. The these guys are mating. Next. Um, I'm into snakes. Not everybody's into snakes. Uh, we're very careful. We walk the trails, keep our eyes out, and every now and then we see we see a snake. Uh, this is a fertilance, and Donna spotted this one. Uh, it had rained. It had rained a couple of inches, and and this guy was off the side of the trail. Next, this is me with a non-venomous snake. The previous one was was venomous. Next, now this uh, as a professor that now I've retired, but I still teach. Uh, when I can see the people that we're facilitating learning with, and I can see this, those looks <laughs> in their eyes, I just feel like, you know, that makes my day, it makes the trip, because I know that people are connecting with what we're doing. Next. Uh, here's a strangler fig, Donna's spoken about them. Um, very important in the neotropics, they're very, they produce tens of, uh, the mature trees can produce tens of thousands of fruits that birds eat and mammals eat. It's like a buffet in the tropics. Next. And this is the, uh, a fig that's been cut in half and uh, strangler figs have uh, very complex symbiotic relationships with fig wasps. In order to, the flowers for the strangler fig are on the inside of the synconium. And the only way they can get fertilized is to ha have a, a relationship with these symbiotic wasps. There are many different types of fig wasps, but the female can go in, if it, she goes into a male uh, fig, she'll fertilize, the, she'll bring pollen in from other, other figs and she can fertil fertilize those flowers. When you eat a fig newton though, I guarantee you, if it's from the tropics, it's gonna have insect parts in it. It makes it helps make them crunchy. Next, uh, uh, primates. We'll see all four species of primates while we're in Costa Rica, and in Corcovado we should see all four there. This is a squirrel monkey. Very charismatic. They're small and beautiful. Next, a picture of a pair of squirrel monkeys. Next, and again, uh, this is a, a former student who's now a professional. I think. Uh, she works with the EPA, at least the last I heard. She's, she loves primates, and uh, for her to see these some kind of things made, made her day. Next. Uh, this is an example of a holler monkey taking it easy in the tropical heat. Next. And this, uh, oh, yeah, this the picture could be better, but that's a baby spider monkey. The acrobats of the neotropical forests are spider monkeys. They have a pre prehensile tail that is very highly developed in terms of its ability to, to, to leap from tree to tree and do the most amazing gymnastic moves of, of any primate I've ever seen. Next. 
This is a white-faced capuchin, and uh, they're, they're quite, quite common. Next. Uh, we'll go to old growth forests uh, in Corcovado. Now, every, every part of the world has been disturbed for the most part in some form or another. But there are parts of the park in Corcovado where you'll see some old growth forest that is just unbelievably awe-inspiring to walk through. Giant trees, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And here we, are, we have a group of people there working in their journals, reflecting upon what they're experiencing. Next. We, you know, we take time, we took time out here to do a waterfall swim. This is at San Pedrillo Station in Corcovado. Uh, it was a great way to cool off and have some fun. Next. Uh, behind the, the, these uh, people are, is a garlic tree that, um, it's huge. The diameter is, is I don't know, you know how many tens of meters it is. Um, it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. Next. We go on night hikes. We go on night hikes in the Caribbean, in Monte Verde area, and then in Corcovado. And uh, th these people, uh, Cole has a, 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 a snake. And Carly has one of the red-eyed frogs. Next. Uh, Donna found this, this frog on the night hike. It's, it's called the glass frog. And what she did was shine the light from underneath the leaf. And you can actually see inside of the frog, hence the name glass frog. Next. Uh, oh, wow. One year, one year, we broke up into two groups or three groups. <laughs> And I happen to be in not this group, but I would, either. Yeah, I would have done anything to see this, this ocelot. Uh, this student, she got these wonderful pictures. Kristen Drew took this yeah. picture. Next. Uh, this is a happy crew after a night hike. We see, you just see all sorts of great, great, great things. Um, so much biodiversity. Every day is filled with, with this sense of wonder. Next. And we do go snorkeling, um, weather permitting, of course. We go out to Kanyo Island and, um, you know, bring the, the, well, they'll supply the mask and fins and snorkel, and we, we do some snorkeling. And uh, there is talk that we'll also try to snorkel on the Caribbean coast too, weather, weather permitting. Next. Uh, while you're in San Jose, we always recommend that people go to the National Museum. It's got ter a just terrific archaeological display from uh, uh, pre-European all the way through the modern days. Next. All right, so, all right, um, Ron, next slide, please. I think I have some, yeah. All right, so in 2024 with the alumni trip, this is where, we, where we've showed you all these slides and all, in our conversations that's where we hope to go in, in 2024. And we've divided it into two sections. There's the, the first section goes all the way through Monte Verde and then back to San Jose. And then we have a second leg for those people interested that would want to go to the Osa Peninsula. So um, Molly, I think I'm going to turn it over to you now. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of those lovely pictures. And um, I know I mentioned to you that my brother traveled with you some years ago, and <laughs> it's a trip that is so memorable. You'd think it happened yesterday, the way he talks about it. So um, those of you who might be sort of pondering and trying to figure out, should I or should I not go, you should probably go because 10 years from now, you'll still be telling your friends about it. So um <laughs> That's just my one endorsement for this. So we do have some questions um, from our viewing audience, a couple of things. And I have to um, mention to you, Donna, the little stick spider yeah. that you were describing. I see those around here. They're probably not the same stick spider. Yeah, they're not the same. But I have seen those and yeah. they are pretty remarkable indeed. All right. So let's <laughs> let's look at a couple of questions we've gotten. Um, this comes from Tom. He asks, are Hold Ridge life zones like eco regions? I'm not sure. I'm not Ronald, sure. Essentially, yes. It's a it's 
uh, an ecoregion generally is thought to be larger. So like the whole Eastern deciduous forest of the US is an ecoregion. Um, the Holdridge life zones are kind of that in miniature. So it's just dividing that ecoregion up into smaller pieces. So yeah, it's all based on the physical characteristics. Oh, okay. That's yeah. actually a really insightful answer. Um, Doug asks simply, what about the ants? Tell us about the ants. What, what is the <laughs> ants? Right. We don't have a single picture of the leaf cutter ants. How can we do that? Sure, we don't. don't no. Oh, I love those little guys. <laughs> Yeah. The ants are wonderful. We've got velvet ants of two different species. Leaf cutters are always a wonderful attraction. These are these are gardening ants, so they go out and cap and grab, they cut leaves and take them back to their uh, nests and grow fungus on them, and they eat the fruiting bodies of the fungus. Fantastic. Yeah, there's lots of different ants, and yes, ants and termites is what makes the world go round. Indeed. Um, yeah, we also, were, maybe what makes the world fall down, too. That's true. <laughs> when we were at the Bree Bree with Ron um, in 2020, we were going for a swim. And I was talking to Ron. And then I'm still talking to Ron. But Ron stopped to look at the leaf cutters. I'd walk maybe 40 feet before I realized, hey, where's Ron? He's, he's looking at the leaf cutters. Oh, they're, and, and it's amazing because it's like these little guys are... For, I mean, it'll be hundreds and hundreds of feet that they'll have this trail that they're just running back and forth. It looks like I-70 on a busy day. And they, they've they all, the ones going one way have on their backs these little, looks like a sail. You know, of course, it's the size of your fingernail, but they're carrying the little portion of a leaf that they've chewed off. And the other the other group is coming back at them and going, well, I did my part. I got to go get more. So they're just- Northbound, southbound traffic, yeah. Yeah, and it literally is a pathway. I mean, I, I'm watching this. You guys had seen it so many times, it probably become old hat to you. But to me, it looked like a pathway that you a, a person, a little bitty person, had, had tra made in the woods. Yeah. That's amazing. The little tiny ants make leave such a big mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, if I could add, uh, when we find these big leaf cutter colonies, sometimes they're massive, and there's green vegetation all around. But they they can be picky about what food they right. want to get their fungus, and they can. I've seen them walk maybe a kilometer away yeah. from their from their central location to get just the right leaf for their for their fungus. Which is huh. Yeah. They're snickety. They've got they've got good taste, I suppose. They're good <laughs> farmers. They know yes. what farmers. They, they know their quality product. Absolutely. When I see it. Okay, so this question um comes from Tom. He asks, are there any recommended readings, especially on the natural history of Costa Rica, that you might um you might suggest as a would-be traveler considers? Jansen Hayes. Jansen, yeah, the Natural History of Costa Rica is, is a classic. Also, um, the, there's a book called The Neotropical Companion, um, and it's been updated, and I love that book. I mean, it's, it's I a, do big, too. a yeah. big book, but uh, it'll introduce you to the, the neotropics in, in, in ways that not many books can do. It's a lot of a lot of great information in there. And then there's a kind of an easy reading one that's just called Tropical Biology. And I can't remember. It's where um, Henry's larva is from. And the, oh, you mean, uh, wait, uh, 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 Jerry's maggot. Jerry's maggot. Yes. Talking about bot flies. Yeah. Right. But, but what is the book? It's just called Tropical Biology, right? No, I think it's Tropical Nature. Tropical nature, yes, Tropical that's what it is. Nature. I can't remember okay. the I can't remember the author, but it's a it's a sweet, easy read. It's more of a naturalist essay that delves into some different topics like bot flies, like how feces disappear. Interesting. In the, woods, the whole idea of the carbon cycle. So he makes it very readable to get a little taste of what's going on. Yeah, really good. Gotcha. So, so okay. those, those are a few readings. That, yeah. that, Okay, oh, that's a good place to start. I would imagine that yeah. if your interest has peaked already, that might sort of take yeah. you down, take you down the right kind of rabbit hole for you. Right. right. Um, let's see. Um, we have a couple couple more questions here. I think we've got enough time. We can work them in. Um, let's see. Rob asks, being on the migration route to the U.S. is Costa Rica. Are there any sort of effects, good or bad, from 
from oh. sort of migration patterns this way. Um, human migrations or migrations of animals? Um, he did not elaborate. Um, let's just go ahead and assume human migration. Unless you can okay. speak to both, uh, in which case. Uh, 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 actually, no, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was, I, I was I'm thinking bird. I, I was thinking yeah, bird. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, real quick. Uh, all right. In Monte Verde, they do this thing. It, it, like we do it here in the U.S. too, right? Christmas bird count. Yes, and, I heard that. Yes, and yes. during the Monteverde cloud forest Christmas bird count, they've counted over 400, as I recall, 450 species of birds. In 65,000 hectares? Yeah, it's in a very small area. Yeah, and many small. of those are migrators birds from that, that lay their nest in North America and then leave because of our Northern Hemisphere winter and head towards Central America and South America. And, and many of them are, are there during the winter, um, our winter. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I, actually sort of leads me to another question. If you could just use like a small collection of words to describe the weather, the common weather pattern in Costa Rica, <laughs> tell us about it. It depends on where you are. Yeah, each one of you come up with something. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say it depends on where you are. Remember, we're talking about a change in elevation from zero to about twelve or 14,000 feet, and you experience a lot of change. Um, mm -hmm. In the lowland tropics, it's hot. It's just hot. It's not my favorite weather. Favorite stuff to see, but it's not my favorite weather. But Monteverde, you're pulling out your jackets, right? Because okay. it's cool all, right. all the time. Sort of running the spectrum. What would you say, Ron? Hey, I found it really interesting in how even during the course of a day, you know, we might get a rain and then then you would see the sun. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, there was there's a lot of humidity. But for me, there is so much other. The weather is not what I thought about it because it was pleasant. Most of the time, temperature range is fairly narrow for the most part. You know, it's what, you know, maybe 65 at night and 85 or so during the day. And, um, but it was, there were so many other things going on uh, that, that the weather became kind of a secondary consideration to me. I mean, the scene behind me is actually, that's in Drake Bay uh, where we stayed. And so we, we had many very sunny, beautiful days that we experienced and, and you got the rain too, but it was just another kind of beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it adds to the whole experience. Mm -hmm. to get rained on. Mm -hmm. um, I expect yeah. to be rained on and I kind of look forward to it, particularly yeah. if you can get a good good uh, gully washer. I, that, yeah, I, yeah. Like, I like those. I'll I never, would imagine yeah. it's a lot like a lot of other sort of sort of tropical climates where it rains for a period and then it maybe doesn't rain right. anymore unless you're like higher elevations and then you're getting... Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Um, I will say that I did take a look at the itinerary for the 2024 trip, and there is a lot of information in there about how to sort of pack with preparedness in mind. Yeah. So um, okay. I'm sure folks who have questions about that can follow up, but there is more information in that itinerary. So, so we're, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if the people were interested in seeing that itinerary, how do they, how do they do that? So they can visit us at miamialumni.org slash travel. And if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you will actually see the 2024 trip. So all the 2023 trips are on top. And then if you scroll all the way down, you'll see um, topping the list of 2024 is this Costa Rica trip. Um, and then, of course, I'll remind our viewers um, when we're signing off. Um but yeah, it's all available there, a lot of information. And if you have questions sort of beyond that, we have some contact information in there for folks to reach out if they have other questions. Hayes. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I think all of us would be happy to speak to anyone that was interested. Oh, in yeah. This. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. We might make some connections for you. We appreciate that. Well, I think that's about it for the time we have. It's about 105. So thank you so much for spending this 
portion of your lunch time with us. We so appreciate the three of you, Hayes, Donna, and Ron, for joining us. I can't think of three better people to tell us about such an extraordinary place. And I'll tell you, my bags are about packed already. So <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to hit the ground running. Um, to register for our viewers or to see the full itinerary of the trip and the many other Miami Explorers uh, travel adventures, please visit Miami Alumni Travel page at Miami Alumni org slash travel. And as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will also be available on our website later today. You can see this in our other presentations at alumlc.org slash Miami OH. Thank you so much, Hayes, Donna, and Ron. You, we appreciate you being here. Love and honor to you all. And thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.